everybody, it's Eric Papenfus. It's Friday, so it must be a bi day. And today we're gonna talk about one of the most important psychological tests of 20th century America and how it grew from a reading of the great American novel. Sound interesting? It does. Well, Amanda, this is sort of a follow-up to a bye day we did last year about the Rorschach test. Do you oh, remember yes. that one? Oh, yeah. Well, um, we will put a link uh, on uh, underneath uh, this video to that one, so you can watch that as well. But there was another test that came out about the same time as the Rorschach test and was used in the 20th century and is still used today. And I found a copy of that test at a book auction, so I thought we could talk about it today. And it is called the thematic apperception test. Oh. Now, this test was developed by a psychologist at Harvard University uh, whose name was Henry Murray. And Henry Murray really wanted to be a Melville scholar. He loved books and he particularly loved Moby Dick. And it was a reading of Moby Dick that inspired him to come up with this test. So I figured we could start also with Moby Dick because this just came in to the buy room as well, Amanda, and it is my favorite ever edition of Moby Dick. Ooh. It is the Rockwell Kent illustrated edition of Moby Dick, which is somewhat famous Ooh. because note whose name is not on the cover of the book. <laughs> There's no Herman Melville. It is the Rockwell Kent well, Moby Dick. Don't you just know that right? it's Melville? And uh, it has this beautiful woodcut style by Kent, and uh, it came out in 1930. <laughs> yes, I know his name is also bigger. <laughs> now, originally, this was commissioned by a publishing outfit in Chicago called the Lakeside Press, and they were going to do a limited edition with Rockwell Kent engravings. It was going to be published in three volumes, and only a thousand copies were made. Uh, uh, Rockwell Kent designed an aluminum sort of uh, metallic slipcase for this uh, for this set, Amanda, and it's something of a white whale for book collectors today. Huh. Everybody wants a copy. So if you ever see three copies of the Rockwell Kent Moby Dick in a metal slipcase, otherwise known as the whale in the pail, that's what they literally call it in the book trade. You need to get it. It's worth thousands and thousands of dollars. Well, okay. But uh, the book was so popular that they uh, Lakeside uh, partnered with Random House, and then they did a sort of scaled-down mm. trade version, and that's what we have here, filled with literally hundreds and hundreds of woodcuts. Hmm. But the part in Moby Dick which uh, interested uh, Henry Murray, who mm -hmm. came up with uh, this test, was the section about the gold doubloon. Do you know the story of Moby Dick well uh, enough to no, know about never, the gold doubloon? I never read it. All right, well, I'm going to take you here to the doubloon <laughs> chapter. Uh, I did read Moby Dick, and uh, uh, I remember vividly this. So Ahab has a gold coin, hmm. Amanda, and he takes it and he nails it to the mast. And he says, whoever sees the white whale first will get to claim this coin, all right? And over the course of the novel, the various characters go up to the coin and they see things in the coin that are mm. different for each person. They might see capitalism or religious iconography or greed or whatever. And Ahab, in this section, I'll read you a little bit, yep. he says, This round is but the image of a rounder globe, which, like a magician's glass, to each and every man in turn, but mirrors back his own mysterious self. Mm. And that gave Murray the idea for this test. Hmm. Um, let me just show you my favorite engraving, which is also in the Dubloon chapter. Oh, wow. That is Rockwell Kent's wonderful. Uh, I say it's wood engraving inspired. These were actually drawn by pen and ink, oh, but wow. they're made to look like a woodcut, uh, wood which yeah. harkens back to like scrimshaw and wooden boats and tattoos. And <laughs> it's just very evocative, right? Yeah. This whale is actually heading towards us, towards the viewer. That's an open oh, mouth, I see. Uh, Amanda, and mm -hmm. it sort of dwarfs in proportion the boat above. Wow. But let's go to the test now <laughs> that we understand uh, Moby Dick. And the test basically um, takes a series of images, just like the Rorschach test, except they're not ink blots. Mm. And it asks, um, it develops a, a sense of somebody's personality by how they respond to the test. And just like it was inspired by the great American novel, it has been referenced in American novel after American novel huh. after American novel, <laughs> especially um, if they're dealing with like serial killers or other criminals. And now I, I want you to imagine either a young Brian Cox from Succession or Anthony Hopkins playing Hannibal Lecter, <laughs> being in prison, having a, uh, a guard sort of walk in 
And uh, I'm just going to read you a little bit. For This is the prequel to Silence of the Lambs, Red Dragon. And it says, uh, uh, tell me the truth. Boy, he picked that up, didn't he? Well, you may not believe this, but Hannibal actually tried to give me a thematic apperception test. He was just sitting there like the Cheshire Cat waiting for MF-13 to come up. Well, forgive me, I laughed. He puffed up and told everybody in the room, I avoided prisoner prison because I had Ganser syndrome. Well, hmm. this just to show you what, <laughs> uh, what MF-13 is, uh, he showed... There's MF-13. Each of the prints was labeled. Oh, this is the one that Hannibal tried to uh, show back on the people that were interrogating him. Ooh. Now, Amanda, I'm not going to give you MF-13 because I don't want any comparisons <laughs> to being uh, Hannibal Lecter Thank in you. this. Yep. But I did pick one that was Rockwell Kent inspired. Okay. So here is a woodcut engraving. Hmm. Um, it is number of the test. If you're curious, this is 17 GF. And uh, if I were Charles Murray, I would ask you the following questions, and we can do it really quickly, Amanda. Okay. What do you think is happening in that picture? Um, to me, it looks like there's a woman up here okay. and people down here who are all working very hard. Okay. And what do you think happened right before that event? Ooh. I'm going to say it was raining and then the sun came out. And, well, how do you think the story is going to end? Or what will, what will happen after? Sure. Um, I think the sun's going to go down and the, it's going to be the end of another day. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> judging from your answers, Amanda, uh, you seem very well grounded and Great. sensible and uh, you <laughs> didn't see anything extraordinary happening. Um, uh, perhaps you might have seen somebody jumping to their death if you had been inclined to look at such a thing. Yeah, or no. maybe it could have been a rising sun and not a setting sun. Your interpretation uh, supposedly tells mm. more about you huh. than uh, it does about anything else. Now, Charles Murray, incidentally, um, goes on to become even more famous because he develops a secondary test which is deeply unethical and which to this day uh, sort of uh, stains his legacy. Mm. It was a stress test for Harvard students and he invited a series of Harvard students into the office and basically um, caused them enormous stress and then recorded it and then um, played it back to them and then talked about why different things stressed them. The problem was that one of the uh, Harvard students who he did this unethical test on was a man by the name of Ted Kaczynski, who later on became the Unabomber yeah. and spent his whole life fighting back against academics like, uh, like Murray. This test here, it was owned by a person by the name of Van Waters, and that person was a woman by the name of Miriam Van Waters, who is very famous for prison reform in huh. 20th century America. Miriam Van Waters started her career in California in the 1920s. I picked up a copy of this report here, which is on uh, problematic uh, children, and uh, it's inscribed, look, it's inscribed by huh. uh, Miriam Van Waters as well. This is in the 20s. Now, she had the revolutionary thought in the 1920s when she was running a home for delinquent girls. They, they weren't just bad eggs, uh, Amanda. They had come from homes in which they didn't have proper role models. Mm. They weren't well supported. So the way that, to treat them was to give them love. Now, this was very <laughs> unconventional Radical. and eventually led a voters to have a backlash in California where they just wanted more punitive uh, reform. So she had to leave California. She goes all the way across to Framingham, Massachusetts, where she runs a prison for women. And uh, unfortunately, she's dragged into the House on American Committee. She's considered mm. uh, both a communist and uh, she's accused of being a lesbian as if this were a bad thing because uh, she was uh, soft on criminals. She wanted to actually help young women get jobs mm. and she wanted to have them be able to stay with their children. And this was far too much uh, at that time in the 50s and 60s America, but now today it's, it's recognized as absolutely revolutionary. So she would have used this test to help those women in the prison. Wow. And we're gonna end today with a funny book. When we did Rorschach, we had a book that is quite famous, Amanda. It was Why Cats Paint. Yes. You remember that book? Absolutely. You've gotta go back and watch that video if you haven't. But today we have another video, which is Why paint cats <laughs> and uh just like the other book this is a serious book amanda because it says that you can tell about your personality by how you paint a cat oh so for instance um maybe uh yeah. you just want complimentary uh affirmation <laughs> or maybe you are subliminally uh talking about radical symbolism oh, in boy. your paint or maybe it's just retro expressionism my goodness 
So that's another issue of By Day Friday. Thanks for watching. I hope you watch next week and every week, Fridays at noon, for more adventures in the world of books.